you have to have a refund policy for the first three days. And by the way, you have to tell them that in your contract. You are physically liable if you don't specifically give them a right to rescission clause and tell them that they have this right, then actually, according to the regulators, this I learned from Greg, you have an infinite refund policy. They could come back in three years and ask for a refund and you have to honor it because you didn't physically put in the contract the right to rescission. Welcome back to the Don't Say That podcast where we spread the good news of compliance. My name is Onyx Ngal, I'm a co-host. Today, it's just me, Greg Christiansen is off on this episode, but we've got some amazing things to go over. Now, we've also, I'm super excited to announce this, for the first time ever, we are launching a free quick marketing assessment offer. That's right. So if you're on YouTube right now, look at the description right below. There's a link, naoac.com forward slash audit naoac.com forward slash audit. Listen, if you're doing at least $500,000 a year in sales or more, you can get a quick high level audit assessment from us where we will have a quick check. Now, if we find a lot of problems, we'll let you know. And then there's an entire audit that we, myself and Greg and my team and Greg's entire team would be willing to do. All right. So if that's of interest to you, check out the link in the description. And of course, guys, we have this book, amazing book being done right now. We are on the fifth edition of it. We are writing and writing and writing. It's in Greg's hands right now. We are absolutely behind. Actually, the book was supposed to have launched by now. We want to do a great job for you. We want this book for you, your team, and everybody you know to be de facto compliance guide. So give us a little bit more time. I'll keep you up to date here on these episodes. All right, Greg will be back soon too, but today, this episode and the next episode will be with me. We're going to go over things I learned, all right, things I specifically learned after having gone through my case. I, I sat down, I did this presentation at Agora recently in front of about 30 people, okay? It was a, it was a pretty intimate um, group and I created this presentation the night before the event started. Um, that's actually a funny story because I I had my typical presentation ready to go, which covered like the rules that you should follow. And then they had two excellent speakers the day before me cover the rules. And I'm sitting there at that night thinking I can't regurgitate the same stuff. So I said, well, what, what do I know that others wouldn't? And that's 15 things. What are 15 things I know from having been sued by the FTC that other people wouldn't know on the surface? And that's exactly what we did. So I decided, why not share it here on this podcast with you as well? So um, there's going to be two episodes, part one. This is part one. Um, it might be three. I don't know. Let me see how long I take. But I, wanna, I don't want to go past about 30 minutes. So if you see me looking over here on the side, I'm just checking the time to see how I'm doing. All right. So let's dive right on in to, oh, wait, before we dive in, duh. Look, I might look like an attorney, but I'm not one. As a matter of fact, it was funny because at this Agora event, I got approached a few times by people saying, hey, how do we sign your firm? And I said, I'm not an attorney. So everything you're hearing today, guys, it's just me. It's for educational purposes only, entertainment purposes only. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. And I need you to make sure you talk to a attorney about anything I talk about. All right? Capiche? All right. Now, look, number one, let's dive right in. Number one of 15. Look, there's no right words to say non-compliant things. I'll tell you what I hear the most right now. First of all, if you're talking to me about compliance, hey, I salute you, I celebrate you, I applaud you because at least you are, um, you're, you want to be compliant. But the question I hear most of the time is a wrong question. And the question is, Anik, how would I say this compliantly? Notice how the name of this book, the name of the podcast is Don't Say That. Okay, the problem, guys, is that there's no right words. There's no right words. I asked Greg something. I said, hey, Greg, how would we say, if someone says, here's how to make $1,000 a day, Greg said, there is no way to say that. There's no right way to say it, period. You can't say it. So don't say that, right? So there's no right words. So example, okay, the three ways that the FTC and state governments have protected against marketers gaming the rules. And that's what you're asking me when you say, hey, how do I say that? What words could say that? You're asking, you're, you're playing a legal battle with an entity that doesn't want to play a legal battle with you or a legal manipulation, right? They've covered their bases using these three buckets. So number one, implied claims. It's a pretty widespread bucket. So if I was sitting here right now talking to you about making money and building a business or weight loss or whatever, and so let's take the weight loss example because we always talk about making money. Um, actually, no, let's talk about the making money example because it's just an easier example. 
let's say right behind me is a Bentley, a private jet, a Porsche, a big ass mansion, and I got cash piled up on this table. And I never actually say, um, here's how to make a thousand dollars a day. But I'm like, hey, you know, it actually what unlocked my success was make when once I started making thousands of dollars a day. So now the marketer will say, hey, I never said how to make a thousand dollars a day. I talked about how I made thousands of dollars a day. Yeah, but you're surrounded by luxurious items and flowing in money. It's an implied claim. So you're not supposed to imply results you can achieve for somebody unless you have substantiated typicality results, which most don't. Number two, misrepresentation. It's a very generic term, but if you, let's say weight loss, in the weight loss space, um, if you are talking about a certain supplement and you're saying this supplement can blah, 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 and help lose weight and help solve this problem, that problem, it's misrepresentation unless, again, you have overwhelming substantiation. So you might not be making a claim, but you might be saying something that's a misrepresentation. Um, just a joke, the other day I'm on Zoom and I log in, um, and I ended up logging in. For some reason, it says my assistant's name. It doesn't say my name. And the other person on the other side is waiting, and they're kind of confused. They're like, oh, why is, why is she on? And then all of a sudden, I talk, and I'm like, hey. And they're like, wait, what's going on? And I said, oh, my God, I don't know. I'm, I'm on my assistant's account. Sorry, my bad. And they made a joke at me. They're like, hey, that's misrepresenting. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Touche, it is misrepresenting. Number three is the blanket coverage of all. Net impression. Look, the, the authorities, the regulators can simply say, well, we listened to what you said and how you said it, how you said it. The net impression we walked away with is you're promising people and people will walk away thinking they can make a ton of money very easily. That's a net impression. It's a subjective matter, but unfortunately what you think isn't what prevails, it's what they think. So when you want to say the wrong thing and you're asking me what words to use, my answer will be don't say that. Okay. So that's how they've protected it. This is something that has come up for me when I was going through the investigation. I came to realize I never had heard of an implied claim. I'd never heard of misrepresent. Well, I know what misrepresentation is, and that was never really a problem in our case. Um, I did not know what net impression was. Never heard of it before. So this is how. So and I was that person too. I, I was the person that would say, "Well, I never said here's how to make a thousand dollars a day. I said here's how you could make a thousand dollars a day. I'm covered. I didn't make a promise. No." It's the two are the same. Okay. Uh, well, they're not the same. One's an expressed earnings claim and one's an implied earnings claim. They're both wrong. Um, so you can't say it. There's no right words to say it. All right, let's move on to number two. This is an interesting one. Did you know that I did not know this? As a matter of fact, I'm going to admit something. This is embarrassing. I didn't know this until like two months ago. <laughs> well, after my case had closed, Greg and I are talking and he happens to mention something. I said, whoa, 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 back that up. What did you just say? The reason I didn't know this is because in my case, consumer complaints weren't really a big issue. We weren't overflowing with negative reviews and negative complaints. And uh, we've done an immaculate job managing our customers, which is one of the confusing things when I got the uh, investigative notice. So I always said this, okay? And this is what people say. So I was told by attorneys for the longest time that if you want to stay out of the grip of the FTC, make sure you don't get a lot of complaints. Make sure you refund people, make sure you keep them happy. If you don't get complaints, they're not going to come knocking. That's how I built my business. That's how I built all my KPIs. That's what I tracked. And we did great, yet it didn't stop at the end of the day from what happened. So here's what I, when, when I got the case, I said, there's no chance that I have a volume of complaints at the FTC big enough to make them come knocking my door. The reason I said that is because I don't even have enough complaints in my support system. People don't just get upset and run straight to the FTC. They usually message you, then they'll usually call their credit card and you have high chargebacks. And typically the next step would be the BBB. And I thought after that, I don't even know how you submit a complaint to the FTC. Turns out a BBB complaint is pretty much an FTC complaint. And what does that mean? There's a system that the FTC created called the Sentinel system. It's a little bit mysterious. I all I was able to walk away was we know for a fact that any FTC complaint goes into it and that BBB complaints get sucked into it too. So actually, if you're getting BBB complaints, it's basically as good as getting an FTC complaint. Um, the, predict, the, the thought is, uh, no confirmation here, is that state AG complaints make it in here as well. 
So we did have about 20 complaints a year or so on the BBB. We resolved all of them, but again, we we're doing about 20,000 transactions. I thought 20 is a drop in the bucket. I thought we're doing excellent. And we probably were. Again, I don't know if that's what led to my case by any means, but the Sentinel system, ladies and gentlemen, a BBB complaint, or we think a state AG complaint is basically the same as getting an FTC complaint because it goes into the same system that they track. All right, number three. This is an interesting story uh, and interesting to know. You need to track your merchant account statements very closely because it will be one of the first key areas that the regulators focus. So in our case, we got a 32-page letter, right, that had many things in it. 32 may not sound like a lot, but guys, it had like 31 different things they were asking for. But some of the things they were asking for would go on to take us hundreds of hours to generate. So the 32-page document was incredibly overwhelming. And so, of course, they give you two weeks to deliver it. When you get that first notice, you have two weeks. That apparently, it's expected that you're going to call them and say, hey, I need more time. And so when we had the call, I wasn't on it. But what I heard from my attorneys was the call started with them saying, we're sure you're going to ask for more time, right? Yes. Well, no problem. We're willing to give you an extension, but there are two things we will not extend. We need these right away. Number one, merchant statements. We want to see all your merchant account statements for every merchant account you have, and we want to see all email communication with any merchant account provider. Interesting. I found that to be fascinating when I was told that by the attorneys. I thought, wow, that really shows you a key area they focus. Well, it turns out a lot of bad players usually have a lot of merchant accounts. They have a lot of smaller merchant accounts. They round robin their merchant accounts quite a bit. On top of that, they typically have chargebacks hitting a certain threshold. If you get to above 50 chargebacks, your account gets shut down. So what they'll typically do is wait until they just teetering above 30, 40, boom, stop using it, go into another account. We had the same merchant accounts, I think it was like two or three, for like the last 15 years or 10 years. So I said, I don't do any of these funny, I don't do any of this funny business, so I'm, I'm game, I'm fine with it. And uh, then they wanted all the communication. I thought that was an interesting thing, right? Because they want to see if you're communicating with your merchant account provider, figuring out ways to load balance and hack things and you're negotiating to get accounts. We weren't. As a matter of fact, the only communication we had was one email that was from our merchant account provider to us during a product launch and that said, why has your processing spiked so much? And we responded and said, um, we're doing a launch. It was like the most unofficial email sequence back and forth, right? We're doing a launch and they said, okay, that's it. It was like three or four emails back and forth. They didn't even have signatures, sign-offs, warm and fuzzy welcomes because we know each other really well. And so when I submitted all of this to my lawyer, I get a response from my lawyer that says, Anik, I think you misunderstood me. We need all merchant accounts and we need all communication. I said, that is all of it. So I did really well in this arena and I do believe it helped, but this is one of the first metrics they looked for. So what does your merchant statements look like? What are your refund rates? What are your chargeback rates? What are your complaint rates? And what are you saying to your merchant accounts? If you're trying to gamify things, guys, if you're doing something wrong, I mean, it's going to come up and it's going to become a central focus. For me, it didn't. Thank God. Number four, this was the second thing. Remember I told you there's two things they said we will not extend. We want these two first. The first was merchant accounts. The second was we want to know everyone you've paid, all your partners, your affiliates, your experts. This is a very quick way to get sucked into somebody else's case. Um, in our case, there were two other people that they brought in and named in our case. They would have been generated from this payout. Now, I can't do anything at this point to not disclose, right? So I have to disclose who I've paid. That is a legal requirement. There's no way I'm going to get around it. And I absolutely was going to cooperate. So if you, at that, point, at that time, if you were my affiliate or my expert that I had been paying, you were on this Excel spreadsheet, it was the second thing that they said we will not. So it clearly tells you they want to see who else has made a lot of money um, to see who else gets kind of put into the case. And so you need to be careful, even if you're not yourself selling a lot of information, pro selling a lot of product, are you the top affiliate, the top dog of another company that is, or are you being published by another company that is doing things that could get them in trouble? Because if they get in trouble, your name will come up. Um, and there's a bunch of names that were submitted that didn't get pulled into the case, but I don't know. Is there someone at the FTC right now looking deeper into them just because this is right? One becomes three, becomes four, becomes 10, becomes 30. 
We don't know. But this is why you need to be very vigilant of who you do business with and what their business practices are. Ironically, their business is your business and you need to be all about it. Number five, I found this to be really interesting as they had given us all their list of things, right? But you could tell based off of where they conversed with us the most, what they asked the most about, you could clearly tell what was their focus point. One of their main focus points was, we want, they actually asked for this. We want to know, and we want to see, not know your refund rate. They knew my refund rate. We had submitted the financials. Now they said, we would like to see every refund request and we would like to see every response to those requests. Audio, written, email, text, whatever. Every request that came through, we want a catalog of every request of refund you had in the last three years. And we want to see it every reply that you made to those requests. So that clearly tells you that the regulators are very interested in seeing how you treat those who want a ref refund. So first and foremost, there's a trend going on in our industry right now where people are doing the final sale, no refunds will be honored. Well, that's illegal, all right? It's actually physically illegal. You, first of all, forget the regulators. You will and could get sued by consumers and you could have a class action. There's, an act there's multiple of these going on that I know about right now against not just information marketing companies, but companies all over the world, um, you have a federal right to rescission that you have to offer. It's a, federally, it's three days. That's a minimum. So for three days, anyone can change their mind of having purchased your product that I think is above, ah, oh man, this is where you miss, Greg. It was either 15 or $25. You can check me on this. It kicks in. So if the product is above 15 or $25 in our industry, the right of rescission applies. If they request a refund within the first three days, you are legally required to provide it and you cannot, and well, you can ask why, but it doesn't matter. You can't reject them for any reason. So when you have that coaching program that you're selling for $10,000 and you have a no refund policy, I'm sorry, you have to have a refund policy for the first three days. And by the way, you have to tell them that in your contract. You are physically liable if you don't specifically give them a right to rescission clause and tell them that they have this right then actually according to the regulators this i learned from greg you have an infinite refund policy they could come back in three years and ask for a refund and you have to honor it because you didn't physically put in the contract the right to rescission now some states for different types of products have longer some states have up to five days some states have seven depending on what type of offer so you and if you're selling in that state you have to abide by the laws of that state so you have to know so here's my thing if you have an unhappy customer and you try to jam policies down their throat you start to send them legal notices they wanted to know by the way any single legal notice legal issue with a customer in the last three years that we had we had to disclose thankfully we didn't have any right? Because we never treated our customers that way. So we won this one too. I think we did very well with this. We never came back up. We took a lot of time to give them all the reports. We did really good with this. Our refund rates, our chargeback rates were, were very low. Our customer satisfaction was very high. Um, and when someone needed it, I mean, I was on the record of having refunded people uh, two years later how, where we had to write a check to them. We couldn't even do it through the system because something happened. They messaged me and they were sick or they had COVID or, you know, they, they lost their job. And so we just, we were never in a position to want to keep people's money. So please, no hardcore policies. It, the, one of the greatest lines of defense you have is to treat your customers correctly. And you know what, guys? If you're going to have a liberal refund policy and that's going to hurt your business, I've heard people say, well, gosh, Onik, if I, if I refund everybody that asked, I'd have a 20, 30% refund rate. <laughs> well, my friend, you have a bigger problem then. You should not have that high of a refund rate. So whatever you're selling ain't good or however you're selling it ain't good. So quit, stop, fix that. You should not be having that kind of refund rate. So be liberal. Okay. Be friendly. Don't, don't sue your customers. Don't do any of that. They don't like it. Number six, substantiation is needed for everything. Ladies, hey everybody, thank you. Welcome to the best training today here on, well, you said it's best. How do you say it's best? Why is it best? That's a absolute statement. Can you prove it? <laughs> so <laughs> that's where you can use some words to soften it, right? Hey, welcome to, in my opinion, the best training on the planet about this topic. Okay, that softens it. <laughs> it's not now an absolute statement. Um, but I was pretty amazed throughout the investigation as to how detailed the regulators got in wanting substantiation. Let me give you an example. So 
Uh, one of the statements that I was using for a long time, truthfully, was that I was voted as top three entrepreneur under 25 by Business Week. Now, one could argue that by the time I was 35, 36, I should probably stop saying it because it's like 10 years old, but um, it was just in my slides that had been making it over and, um, of, as, and other things, Inc. 500, this and that. Guys, here's what happened. Business Week magazine was gone years ago, years ago, got bought out by Bloomberg. Bloomberg goes in and just hit control alt delete. <laughs> so businessweek.com and all the articles and everything are dead are gone. So the links to this thing are gone. I can't find the back issue of the magazine. What had happened is that there was this big campaign, people voted, I came in number 2. Now, I don't want to say I was number 2, albeit someone recently said I could have said runner up. That's a pretty good term. I never thought about that, but I so instead of saying I was number 2, I would say I was in top 3. It's true. It was true. I didn't make that up, but I didn't have the physical magazine in my hands and the URL I had, which I had sent around to people in my emails, I found it, was dead. It was gone. And the FTC couldn't find it. They wanted to, this was a thing, guys. This became a thing. It lasted about seven, eight, nine days. They wanted substantiation for that. I want to make sure you're not lying about this. Were you really in the top three? So I'm sitting there sweating bullets trying to find it because I know it's not a lie. And I'm like, but I can't prove it. I don't have anything on me. Thank God for archives.org. And I don't know who it was. It was a friend of mine, whoever it was. Thank you. I don't remember you. Sorry. But they said, why don't you go text, take that URL, put it on archives.org. I did. And I found it. And I found the link. And I found the article. It was chopped up, but it was enough. So we sent that notice to them, said, guys, it's gone, but we found it using archives.org. Like, boom, done. It was good. We never had to talk about it again. But they wanted that substantiated. Charity donations. A lot of marketers, unfortunately, lie about their charitable donations. So if you are saying that you're donating, keep proof of it. Make sure you have proof of it. Um, hey, I was in a situation um, where on the webinar I said, hey, I spoke to Damon John. Damon John has agreed to do X, Y, Z for our customers that do blah, 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 blah. And I mean, it was I'm not lying about that. I wouldn't lie about something like that um, with a name as big as Damon's. But I, I didn't have a written record of it. So they wanted to see proof of that. So you've got to really sit down and go through your copy and see anytime you've said something that is a claim, you need to be able to back it up. And so at Complyly, which is the software we're developing right now, which just went into beta, which is awesome. Um, it's, I, I like to tell people, I said, we've built the steering wheel, the car, like the structure of it, the accelerator, the brake pedal, and a, a, and a door. <laughs> so it's like the engine oh and the engine is in there so that's what we've got you can go from pl place a to place c but you you can't there's no ac there's no you know there's no music it's not a fun joyous trip uh it's a trip we've got that though we're working on getting that engine even better um so i'm super excited about it but that's gonna be able to do all this for you so what it's gonna do is it's gonna go through your all your copy your sales calls it's gonna be like boom 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 there's things being said here do you have substantiation if you do upload it so that you can actually turn our software into your substantiation bank keep all of it in one place if anyone asks it'll be there um so anyway substantiation what you think they want when they say substantiation and what they want are two different things all right. That was what I learned. All right. Number seven. Now I'm going to get through the first eight today and then we're going to do the remaining uh, six, seven um, on part two. This is interesting. So um, one of the things that I found to be disheartening was that I can't even use my own results. So uh, prime example, I'm very good at webinars and I've used webinars in the past to sell well over $50 million worth of products. It's a true statement. I can substantiate it. I went back, got all the data. I said, so you're telling me, I went to Greg. I said, you're telling me I cannot say this? And it was what was really interesting here. Greg said to me, and this is a fine line. So you need to get this reviewed by an attorney because it can be crossed very quickly. Greg said, why are you using it? I said, what do you mean? He said, what's the purpose behind you wanting to tell someone that you've done 50 million in webinars? I said, well, I mean, why should they listen to me, right? If I'm going to hire an entrepreneurial coach to help me build a software company to sell for a billion dollars and the guy has never done it himself, then why would I hire him? So I would want him to tell me that he sold multiple companies at you know billion dollars and that's why I'm hiring him. So he said, bingo. Greg said, if you were saying what you're saying for credibility reasons, 
as long as you add plenty of context, you can say it. You got to be able to back it up. But if you keep coming back to it every 15 minutes, oh, I made $50 million. Oh, I mean, then you're creating a net impression and an implied claims issue. Aha, remember, we talked about this early on. But if you're using it purely for credibility, this is how I did it. Right. I don't make a big fuss about it. I'm pretty specific about it. And when I actually am in the video, I talk about the fact that, guys, you are not going to make this. This is ridiculous. It took me years of skills development and I have a great team and all of this stuff. I am only telling you this so that you see my credibility. I am telling you this is not a result you will obtain so let's just get that out of the way. Like I'm so distinctly clear about how I use it and I just use it. I think in the entire sales page, I used it twice. Um, and by the way, going on to add context, one of the headlines in there was I've invested over $18 million in paid advertising. So I don't just share the positive. The context comes in where I'm like, Hey, by the way, like I also had to spend like $20 million to make this right. So it's not going to happen for anybody overnight. This is all I'm trying to achieve right now. When I tell you this, all I'm trying to achieve is that you guys know I've invested a lot of resources, time and money to master a skill. And now I have something to offer you to teach you this skill. So that way, that context will soften and make it possible for you to use it. Now, this is about as close to some kind of like advice that I've given on this podcast. Hence, I want to again say I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Um, and this is very, very murky territory. So you have to use it right. So this would be one of the areas where you would have a lawyer look at it real quick because they will best tell you whether you are crossing that chasm into net impression issues or not. Okay. Last but not least, testimonial rules. This has become one of the FTC specifically, I can't speak to state AGs or not, but for the FTC for sure. Um, and the reason I can speak to this is they're public about it. They're out there beating the drum saying, hey, testimonials and endorsement rules. You better follow these. You better not, you know, manipulate these rules. And it took a lot of work to kind of summarize those rules. And I will tell you right now that most all people I'm looking at in our industry of information marketing or coaching, 90, I'm completely guessing right now. I have no numbers to back this up. Um, I would just guess that 95 out of hundred, it's like 95% of people are just not using testimonials correctly. Greg has broken it down. Awesome though. Okay. Oops. Oh, sorry. I, I put that up that, that slide a little too soon. All right. So here's four rules around testimonials. Number one, you have to have a written permission. You cannot use their name and likeness to generate money in a commercial environment without their written permission, ideally, Greg said, an affidavit, which says that in that written permission, they're also attesting to the honest and truthful nature of whatever they're saying. Now, hold on. <laughs> That's not enough. It's required. It's necessary, but it's not enough, right? It's like this. If you want to lose weight, you have to eat less, but just eating less alone may not help you lose weight. You also have to drink more water. You also have to move and you know hit the gym. So just like here, in order to have a compliant use of testimonials, you need to have a signed affidavit permissions, like basically, best not enough. Number two, if there's a claim in that testimonial, I lost 38 pounds. I cured my, you know, digestive problems. These are claims. There has to be substantial substantiation. Okay. You have to personally review it. Uh, I flipped 13 houses thanks to this training. Okay. Greg says. You want to say that in a testimony? You want that testimonial? You got to go to the person and say, send me the 13 buyer contracts. Send me the 13 this. Send me the transaction details. I need all of that. I need to know that you did it. I need to know you made profit. I need to confirm how much profit you made. It's kind of onerous. Most people would not want to go through all that mess. But if you want to use a claim, people say, well, why do I, why? So I'm not saying it. They said it. Yeah, but now you're using it in your marketing. So if you're using it in your marketing, you're responsible for it. Listen, if somebody puts something random out there, and you never showcase it, highlight it, never encouraged it, had nothing to do with it. How could you be held liable for it is what someone would say. Unless they're of course now, unless they're linking to your course and making money and now they're an affiliate and you're making money because they're, see what happens? If the statement they make an endorsement and testimonial they use as a claim that in any way directly generates revenue or helps conversion for you, you're responsible for the claim. You have to substantiate it. Number three, is a typical result. Someone made $38,000 in a month by following your guidance and your advice. Is that typical? 
can they expect to, can can a typical person so i um we did a episode guys where we talked about um what was it it was um um i think we did testimonials specifically there's an episode i'm sorry a couple of episodes ago where we talk about beach body and how they are the best at achieving typicality i don't want to cover all of that again here it'll be repetitive but you can have a typicality study and you can use results based testimonials, but you just have to put the work in to get it. So Beachbody is really good. The way that they deliver the program to you and collect information from you from the beginning through to the end, they're developing substantiation, written evidence, written proof, affidavit. And what they're able to do is get a typical result. Hey, for the average person who does our 12 week program and follows a diet plan and does everything the way we say it, their average weight loss was blah, blah, blah. And now testimonials that stand around that typicality, they can use. So what's it, it has to be typical. If you have an outlandish, we love to use the so-and-so made $10 million with my coaching and training. I've done it. I've been there and I love it. And I'm super proud of them and I'm excited, but guys, you can't use it in your marketing because it's not typical. All right. Last but not least, clear and proximate disclosure. So a lot of people think that you can just have that little text at the bottom of the sales page and, or I've seen some webinar hosts say, I talked about it in the beginning. I don't have no. So here's the thing: you got to talk about it in the beginning. You got to talk about it in the end. And every time you make a claim, somewhere nearby, proximity and clear near that. So if I just said, Jonathan lost ten pounds, you know, Marcy lost nine pounds. Even if I've got all of these other things, right? I got typicality. I got, I've got substantiation. I've got the written affidavit. If I've got all of that, once I'm done, kind of piling those three or four stories, I have to have a disclosure. I have to have it. Hey. I'm so glad you listened to that. But just remember, these people went through the whole program. They did everything exactly how we teach it. That is not a typical result of anyone who buys a program. It, blah, 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 blah. You have to disclose. You have to have a lawyer check those disclosures out for you. Now, that brings us to a close of this episode. So remember, guys, uh, seven more coming up next week, part two of this uh, series. Uh, please, please, please make sure you go to don'tsaythat.com and sign up and put your name and email in for this book when you're to be alerted when it's ready to go. Make sure you're prepared not to just buy one copy, buy 10, buy 30, buy 100. Buy one for all your team members so that they understand what the rules are and the guide guidelines are. Also, NAOAC, National Association of Advertising Compliance, NAOAC.com forward slash audit, A-U-D-I-T. NAOAC.com forward slash audit. If you're on YouTube, go click this, uh, the link below. If you're making over a half a million dollars a year and would like to participate in our absolutely free assessment um, to kind of get a gauge of where your marketing is and your compliance is, that gives you an opportunity to learn more about our marketing audit services as well, then go ahead and schedule yourself a time to talk to one of our representatives. Again, NAOAC.com forward slash audit. This is Onyx Gala on behalf of Greg Christiansen. Thanks for listening. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we have more things coming up for you. We're going to have a killer year of teaching you some amazing things about compliance and spreading the good news of compliance. With that said, as I always say, when life pushes you, stand straight, smile, and push it the heck back. Talk to you later. Bye.